Okay, it's one o'clock, so we might as well get started. Welcome everyone. And just before I pass it over to Tara, a couple housekeeping items. Um, presenters, please keep yourselves on mute when you're not presenting. Um, feel free to take yourselves off mute if you're answering any questions, um, and I can help you with that if you have any trouble. Um, for all of our attendees, please put all of your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So you'll see a little Q&A icon down there that you can open up and address your question to one of our panelists or our presenters today. Um, if you can put their name before the question, just so we can keep track of um, who you're asking the question to. If we don't have time to get to their to your question during their session, they may pop in and answer it afterwards. So we just want to make sure that they know uh, which questions they have to answer in case there's some overlapping topics. And with that, I will pass it over to Tara. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Tara Carpenter, and I'm the coordinator of the Long Point World Biosphere Reserve uh, Research and Conservation Conference. So if you joined us this morning and you're returning, thank you so much. And uh, if you're new with us the, this afternoon, um, thank you as well. So uh, let me see. The Long Point World Biosphere Reserve Foundation acknowledges that we meet on the traditional territories of the Atawandaran, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabe peoples and show respect today to the communities of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory and the Mississaugas of the Credit, whose treaty lands include the Long Point World Biosphere Reserve. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in today uh, on this balmy autumn day. <laughs> and uh, considering how beautiful it is outside and you still chose to join us, shows me the high level of interest in conservation and research in our region. The sheer importance of this goes beyond Long Point, beyond Norfolk County, beyond the Lake Erie watershed. It is important for the health of our environment and ultimately our children's future. I wanna thank all of today's presenters for their very hard work, physical and otherwise, uh, passion and, and their passion in what they do. I would also like to thank the Long Point World Biosphere Reserve Foundation Board of Directors, volunteers, Rick Levesque, the uh, Biosphere President, Sandy Jukes, uh, the Biosphere Administrator, and especially Amanda Howes, uh, the Director of the Board for being our technical support today. So the Long Point uh, Biosphere Reserve is an area of global ecological significance that makes an ongoing commitment to the United Nations to, to strive for sustainability. Visitors and residents are inspired to co coexist in harmony with nature. The Long Point Biosphere Reserve is in Norfolk County on the North Shore of Lake Erie in the heart of Carolinian Canada hosting more endangered species per capita than the rest of Canada. It is home to the greatest number of plants and animals and the highest densities of wildlife in all of Canada. The Long Point Walsingham Forest Priority Place was selected by Environment and Climate Change Canada because of its high biodiversity, large number of species at risk, highly engaged local conservation community, and significant environmental threats. The Priority Place Initiative is implementing the Pan-Canadian approach to species at risk uh, conservation through an agreement between federal, provincial, and territorial governments across Canada to conserve species and their habitats. So our first presenter for this afternoon is uh, Mandy Karsh. And uh, Mandy, has been dedicated to the Ontario Road Ecology Group for over a decade, initiating research projects, launching citizen science programs, facilitating government and non-governmental collaborations and championing policies and mitigation measures that enhance landscape connectivity to improve the way wildlife road in, um, interactions are managed. Welcome and thank you, Mandy. 
Thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone, for, for attending this afternoon's session. I'm going to share my screen and we'll go from there. Is that, let's see. All right, okay, thank you everyone. So yes, we're here to discuss the Integrated Conservation Action Plan for the Long Point Walsingham Forest. And the purpose of the ICAP is to identify the highest priority strategies and actions for improving ecosystem health and conserving species at risk. The vision is to create and support healthy, resilient and connected ecosystems that support biodiversity, productive landscapes and a thriving community. There are various threats that are recognized as top priority to address. And of course this session will discuss the threats of roads and roads fragment the habitat um, and are a direct source of mortality for many species at risk, reptiles and amphibians. But of course, the threats of roads um, affect all taxes. So we're expanding to include all biodiversity and mitigating all the threats um, that we can. The goals of the roads working group is to enhance road infrastructure to facilitate safe wildlife movement across the landscape and improve the way wildlife road interactions are managed. Um, at the base of each strategy is research. We have to measure and monitor so that we can adapt and tweak so that we're constantly moving in a progressive manner. We have to, you know, this is the dynamic living document that we're always striving for improvement. So the main strategies are public engagement, policy and mitigation. And each strategy requires collaboration and cooperation. The first strategy is public engagement. And we know there's so many kilometers of roads. And of course, this is not unique to Norfolk County, but spans North America. So making motorists and people who use transportation networks aware of the threats of roads to wildlife and engage the community in stewardship efforts. So letting them know the threats, why it's important to mitigate the threats and how they can act in ways to help protect biodiversity from the threats of roads. And of course, Norfolk County is a tourist destination. So more than just making local community aware, it, it would be wonderful to, this is a little add on, um, you know, when, when people welcome are, are welcome to Norfolk County, um, you know, all the various attractions also um, to maybe have a message from the county saying, you know, we are rich in biodiversity, please watch for wildlife on our roads. So just getting that message out is, is really critical. Um, something that CWS and uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada uh, put out earlier this year. This features the beautiful artwork of local naturalist and artist Cindy Present is again, just another postcard um, that was received in the mail um, to make people aware of wildlife on the roads and on the back, it gave them real actions they can take to, um, in, you know, in terms of how they behave as motorists, um, make them aware of these wildlife on the road and give them an action step to report that those data because if we you have those data the more opportunistic data the better we can inform a mitigation strategy and, and this postcard will be released again um, to a, engage a larger audience as well uh, social media is wonderful for helping to spread the word uh, many partners many of whom are, are participating this afternoon took this message and and shared it among their networks again just making people aware um, to watch for wildlife and to please report sightings. And it's really important to engage, you know, the local users of the road network themselves. You know, um, we have motorcyclist clubs and, and I always give them the most credit because they spot the hatchlings and the snakes and they're so intimate with the road network that they're really fundamental in, um, you know, raising that awareness and education and then giving them an outlet to contribute to conservation. So local engagement is, is critical. Another um, tool we have 
for raising awareness is the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario's Wildlife Habitat Awareness Sign. The purpose of this sign is for conservation. Raise driver awareness of species at risk in areas where they have been found to be in the greatest danger of mortality from wildlife vehicle collisions with the goal to reduce species at risk mortality due to vehicle strikes. And the, the use of this sign is meant to be interim. It's not, it's not the end point. It's just a place to mark uh, for more research and permanent mitigation measures um, when there's an opportune time to implement. And of course, it's never a substitute for avoiding species at risk habitat and fragmentation by roads. And these signs, we have a lot of data. We worked with many partners for collecting data. Um, EcoCare International generated a hotspot map using GIS landscape layers. Uh, we have current data from citizen scientists and staff uh, going out to collect road mortality hotspot data. So we know where we can place these signs that they'll have the most benefit. Another message I always like to mention is, you know, roads, they're very, there's a lot that can be seen on roads. So, um, it, you know, and turtles and other wildlife are using the road and, and the illegal animal trade is still quite rampant. So if there's ever anything unusual spotted, there are numbers you can call to help mitigate um, the illegal traffic of wildlife. The next main strategy after you've made the public aware and supportive and understanding of the importance of mitigation is municipal policy and guidelines. It's important to seek opportunities to integrate road ecology policy and practices in routine municipal processes. Uh, and there's a lot of guiding documents that we can look to. The first being the official plan. And there was a workshop back in March and the city of Guelph graciously presented their official plan that has specific verbiage to how to add wildlife crossing uh, road ecology into the official plan. And when you go through Norfolk County's official plan, there's so many opportunities to, to examine the various policies with that road ecology lens. And a great first section to start with is the natural heritage. Um, section. So the county supports the protection of species at risk and the implementation of species recovery strategies, the conservation of replanting of roadside vegetation, and the creation of new habitats, natural vegetation regeneration with development proposals. So, so there's already that in place. And certainly, you know, there are many species at risk recovery documents that specifically mention, um, you know, that, that the threat of roads is a high priority and specifically um, recommend mitigating those threats. So the fact that that's already in the official plan, it's, it, it's, a, it's a good bridge. We just have to make it a little bit more specific um, to road ecology. Another section to look at is the aggregate aggregate resources uh, section in section four, where we know, you know, Ontario, there's there's a requirement to rehabilitate a pit and quarry. And this can be any number of uses. So where it makes sense to build a school, you build a school, but where it makes sense to build habitat for habitat connectivity, where it makes sense to put in road mitigation to connect to either side of the landscape, you know, a wetland or, or forest habitat um, makes good sense. Other areas of, this, of the official plan include section eight, when it uh, looks at networks and infrastructure, you know, under noise, vibration, uh, light emissions, these are all road concerns as well that threaten uh, biodiversity. So just different areas where, again, you can apply that road ecology lens to help um, just make and mitigate the threats of roads. Another section is section five, where it talks, uh, speaks to maintaining healthy communities, where we're looking at how to connect the community in terms of active transport, but where there's um, possibility to enhance or restore wildlife corridors, that should be examined as well. Because when we're looking at mitigation in the road, it needs to connect habitat on either side of the road. That, that really augments the success and makes the budgeting add up a little bit better. Other Norfolk County guiding documents include the sustainable master plan that addresses the long term planning for water, wastewater and transportation infrastructure with the intent to identify infrastructure improvements and opportunities uh, to strategically integrate projects to minimize costs. And again, road ecology is all about that. We want to have double duty where we can. So looking at the climate change adaptation plan. Um, is another good area, you know, going through that, it doesn't speak to wildlife corridors, but we have examples um, from New Jersey, for example, where there's a technical manual in section 10 that really highlights the importance of, of 
incorporating wildlife passage in, uh, into new bridge or culvert design when a road um, fragments the habitat. So it's, it's just looking for opportunities where we can, we can add these road ecology perspectives and procedures to help make infrastructure more efficient. And this does exist again, there's a good you know, platform in, the official, in Norfolk County's official plan um, that prior to development, consider where appropriate, enhancing the vegetation and wildlife habitats and corridors along stormwater management systems. And again, Ontario has other supportive documents that help guide this process in terms of planning and design. A really nice figure uh, is out of Toronto Region Conservation Authorities crossing guidelines for valley and stream quarters. There's so many amazing documents um, at the provincial level from the conservation authorities at municipal levels. There's lots of amazing resources out there to pull from to help inform this process. The final strategy is mitigation, of course. We need to see this on the landscape, you know, modifying the landscape for habitat connectivity, allowing these animals to move safely through the habitat, especially as climate change, you know, causes resource availability to shift. These animals need safe passage through the landscape and that's through infrastructure such as bridges, culverts, fencing and shelves. And of course, wherever you modify the landscape, uh, you have to monitor and maintain that infrastructure in order to make sure that it continues to function as intended and protect biodiversity. So a, a good way to do this is through budget lines. That way it's, it, you're not reinventing. Of course, Norfolk County has, invent, uh, has invested in mitigation, but having it as a dedicated budget line just sort of facilitates future conversations and just makes it part of the you know, routine municipal process um, in, in future work. And you know something that could, some of these uh, mitigation measures are you know require planning and years and funding to implement others can be done right away and and in fact you know give cost savings um, whether it's vegetation management grading ice control etc and again there's a lot of different documents um, at various levels of government or produced by non-government conservation groups that that um, inform and instruct how to go about doing this. So there's a lot of good resources out there. It's just a matter of integrating it into routine transportation procedure. And of course, roads being, you know, across the landscape and, and many different landowners, bordering roads, it's always about collaboration. Um, working with partners, and again, many are, are, are here right now, so we thank you and for raising awareness and just finding different ways to make the landscape connected for wildlife. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Mandy. Uh, definitely a concern for everyone everywhere is sharing busy roads. The roads seem to be getting busier and busier all the time. And one thing that came to my mind while I was listening is that uh, it's like the turtle um, is like our panda. <laughs> Not so fussy, but <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the panda is like, our, the turtle is our panda. And we all know that the eco passages on the causeway are dear to our hearts. And I love how you ended with collaboration. Um, that is very dear to my heart as well. And I think collaborating, and maybe that's why some of you are here today, is very important um, to work together, is gonna be very important in our future. So um, we have a couple of questions here and I'm going to read them out since we have some time. <clears throat> so uh, first one is from uh, Hannah McCurdy Adams. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> There you go, okay, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Uh, so this is for Mandy, obviously. If the habitat awareness signs increase awareness and earmark locations for further mitigation and research, why is that not the goal rather than reducing mortality, which is unlikely to be successful? It seems like this would help reduce the excuse to install signs as the only solution to reduce mortality rather, rather than the far more effective mitigation measure of fences leading to crossing structures. There's a lot, a lot there. You might have to repeat some, some parts. Um, 
So MTO's sign is is intended for provincial roads, um, not 400 series highways, but um, smaller roads. Um, the sign, of course, you know, can be expanded to municipal purposes. So the goal is is a Ministry of Transportation goal, but I, I, I hear your point, Hannah, for sure to make, to sort of modify that, to make it more in line with what it actually, the sign serves. Um, sorry, he had, <laughs> it was a long question. I don't remember the, as it progressed, what, what is the second or third? Um, just talking about, um, I think you've answered it um, as best. And I think uh, during the next presentations, then you can speak to it further. But I do have one more and I'm gonna pronounce her name properly because she prompted me how to. And uh, <laughs> Betty Cheney, is there a specific person working with the county staff to implement these suggestions? Yes, so as mentioned, I mean, look, from what where the roads group varies a little bit from others, a little bit, not all, not in all aspects though, is it's the county's road. It's their, it's their community, it's their tax dollars, it's their budget. So it 100% it relies on collaboration and cooperation. Um, the recommendations are from a road ecology perspective. Um, we see across North America, you know, like I said, at all levels of government that, that there is a trend and a cultural shift to adopt road ecology as mainstream routine practice. Uh, but of course it has to be uh, a Norfolk County initiative. So yes, we are absolutely working with Norfolk County and they've been very gracious and supportive and, and it's, we're grateful. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think that's all the questions. And like I said, um, Hannah, um, Mandy will um, um, try and answer it. Yeah, we can follow up. Depth. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the next presenter is Doug Tozer. I was, well, I was leading up to this, I was trying to think how many years he's been presenting with us. <laughs> thank you. It just shows how important his research is and uh, what all he does for the local um, Birds Canada. Uh, Doug is Director, Water Birds and Wetlands at Birds Canada in Port Rowan, Ontario. He did his undergrad at the University of Guelph and went to grad school at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. At Birds Canada, he leads the Great uh, Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program, the Canadian Lakes Loon Survey, and the Long Point Waterfowl and Wetlands Research Program. So welcome and thank you once again, Doug. Thank you very much for the warm introduction. Um, we'll just get the visuals going here and then we'll get started. Okay. Well, okay, so the title of my talk is Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program, 25 Years of Conserving Birds and Frogs. <clears throat> so, you know, 2020 has obviously been a remarkable year for a number of reasons. Add to these the 25th anniversary of the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program operated by Birds Canada every year since the mid 1990s. <clears throat> and you know, to monitor annually for a quarter century like that, it really speaks loads to the importance of the program. So to celebrate, we produced the report that you see here. And in it, um, one learns that 1800 citizen scientists have volunteered 150,000 hours worth an amazing three million in-kind dollars to collect information on birds, frogs, and their habitats at 6,500 unique survey locations throughout the Great Lakes Basin in Canada and the US. <clears throat> one also learns that the four main outcomes of the program are one, assess populations of marsh birds and frogs at scales ranging from individual marshes right up to the entire Great Lakes Basin. Two, investigate associations between marsh birds and frogs and their habitat. Three, contribute to conservation management and planning. And fourth, and maybe this is one of the most important, is increase public awareness of the importance of wetland conservation. 
And indeed, you know, pursuing these outcomes is very important, considering that the latest population trends in the report for 18 marsh breeding bird species show that 40% of them increased over the past 25 years. Another 30% remained about the same, you know, meaning their, <clears throat> their populations bounced up and down a little bit, but there was no, you know, linear increase or decrease. Uh, and then the, the remaining 30% all decreased by quite a bit. And the decreasing species tend to be those that are the most dependent on marshes for breeding. So American coot, black tern, common gallinule, pied billed grebe, sora, and Virginia rail. You know, what do we think of as the, re, the secretive elusive marsh bird species? Um, frogs, on the other hand, appear to be faring a little better. Trends in occupancy in the report for eight marsh breeding frog species show that about half remained about the same over the past 25 years, 40% increased and only one species, the chorus frog significantly decreased. We also learn in the report some important patterns among different populations made possible by the unique information generated by the program. For example, some bird species, particularly Sora and Virginia rail are more abundant at inland marshes compared to Great Lakes coastal marshes. And this, you know, this tells us that Great Lakes coastal marshes are important for conserving marsh birds, but it also tells us that inland marshes are critical strongholds for declining species. And that's something that hasn't been uh, discussed quite as much. Plus we learn a number of other important patterns in relation to Great Lakes areas of concern, for example, and among different lake basins that are useful for conservation management and planning. And we learn of a similar type of thing for frogs, you know, certain species like great tree frog, wood frog and spring peeper especially are more common at inland marshes compared to Great Lakes coastal marshes. Plus there's various other useful patterns also reported. So these population trends and patterns are of course one of the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program's most important contributions. But the report goes much further than this by celebrating and summarizing the various different ways that Birds Canada leverages this information and other aspects of the program to conserve marsh birds and frogs. And this is what I would like to focus on today and expand on in a few instances during the remaining time. And at the end of the talk, I'd like to briefly describe two new areas of research that we're currently pursuing. Okay, so the report has a nice spread based on data from the program that shows how wetland conservation projects completed by migratory bird joint ventures benefit marsh birds and frogs, including some conservation project wetlands in the Long Point World biosphere, like you can see down there on the map. This is important because it justifies more resources to conserve marsh bird and frog populations. But I won't talk in further detail about this here, in part because I presented on this topic at this conference in 2018, and I know there are a fair number of returnees in the audience. So if you're interested in more detail, please check out the report online, the website shown there. The report also has a great spread based on data from the program on how control of non-native invasive Phragmites benefits marsh birds and frogs. But again, I won't talk about this in further detail here because I presented on this topic at this conference last year. And we've already <clears throat> had an excellent presentation on this topic by Eric earlier today, this morning. So again, if you're interested, I highly encourage you to check out the details in the report online. Okay, so how then does Birds Canada use data from the program to conserve marsh birds and frogs? Well, here's a selection. Each year we fill dozens of requests for the program's data through our online nature counts data portal for applications on, well, you name it, environmental assessments, climate change research, species at risk mapping, and so on. Nature Counts is even plugged in across all of North America as the only Canadian node of the avian knowledge network. So this program's data are discovered by users from across the continent and beyond. Together, these many applications of the program's data result in wetlands being protected and restored for marsh wildlife. We supply Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program data to the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, or CASEWIC for short, to assess species and make recommendations on how species should be listed or not listed under Canada's Species at Risk Act, or SARA. For example, as shown here, the decision to list least bittern as threatened was made based in part 
on the program's data. The program's data also played an important role in listing the Great Lakes population of the Western chorus frog as threatened under Sarah, as you can see at the top right. In these decisions then result in a long list of conservation actions on the ground and funding to support them, of course. Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program data are included in the State of the Great Lakes Report, an influential document among policy and decision makers. It's required under the Canada-US Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And the program's data presented in various creative ways, like you see here, help show the need for resources to restore and protect wetlands. So as a result, hundreds of millions of dollars for wetland conservation work has been awarded in the US under the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative as well as sizable amounts in Canada under the similar Great Lakes Protection Initiative. And numerous wetlands are now supporting healthier marsh bird and frog populations as a result. We've also repackaged the program's data and results at the watershed level, such as we see here in a report comparing the state of marsh bird and frog populations in three different regions. One, the Nottawasaga Valley Lake Simcoe watershed to the urban dominated greater Toronto area, and three, the agriculture dominated extreme southwestern Ontario. And by doing this, we illustrate to readers what could happen to the occurrence of marsh birds and frogs in the Nottawasaga Valley Lake Simcoe watershed if agriculture or development were to increase to the same levels that they occur in these other contrasting regions, which you know ultimately calls people to action to conserve wetland resources. We use uh, data from the program to also to assess status of wetland wildlife within Great Lakes areas of concern, which are locations around the Great Lakes that have experienced extreme environmental degradation due to human activities. In a recent partnership with scientists from the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority shown here, we use the program's data in part to evaluate how well wildlife populations are faring in the Toronto and Region area of concern. We found some encouraging results that may justify delisting the impaired status of wildlife within the area. However, despite this positive outcome, we highly recommend continued restoration of wildlife habitat and protection of existing wildlife habitat within the city. The results of these types of assessments help a great deal in choosing the best path forward for conserving marsh birds and frogs in these important areas. Perhaps one of the biggest contributions the program makes to wetland conservation is the creation of decision support tools for migratory bird joint ventures operating under the North American Waterfowl Management Plan of the North American Bird Conservation Initiative. How do you like that for lots of long titles? In a recent partnership with scientists from Ducks Unlimited Canada, we used the program's data to identify the best places for future wetland conservation work by joint ventures throughout Southern Ontario. This will help target the best wetlands for restoration, protection, and other conservation actions that will benefit not just waterfowl, but other marsh breeding birds as well. And note near the bottom of the map that the Long Point World Biosphere shows up prominently, of course, as a major hotspot for marsh bird biodiversity. Of course, not all the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program's contributions to conservation are driven by the program's data. A large part of the tremendous power of citizen science monitoring programs like this one lie with engaging, educating, and motivating members of the public to take conservation action. In the recent 25-year report, we included a large selection of quotes from the program's participants that well illustrate this powerful effect. So here's my top three picks. Some of these are a bit long, but bear with me because I think they're really good and they tell quite a bit. So wetlands within the Great Lakes Basin provide so many natural, cultural, and spiritual benefits. The work that Birds Canada does through the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program is critical to their preservation. Not only does the program collect important data about the quality of wetlands, but it gets people outside exploring and navigating these important areas and provides a platform for a meaningful connection to the landscape and those that in inhabit it. Another really good one, <clears throat> with so little natural space remaining to sustain native species, 
Monitoring sensitive bird and frog populations through the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program can be a big step towards preserving a healthy ecosystem. Birds Canada provides the tools, training, and opportunity for nature lovers to learn about, explore, and help protect critical wetland habitat for the animals that rely on them for their very survival. And last but not least, the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program expanded my knowledge of ecosystems and the impact of environmental changes in the area. By monitoring in the evening and at night, it opened up a new world of sight, sound, and smells that I didn't appreciate during the day. It also gives me an opportunity to interact with the public, share my monitoring experiences, and educate about the wetlands and their inhabitants. Most of all, though, the program is something I enjoy. So that gives us a decent overview of the various different ways that Birds Canada uses population trends and patterns and other aspects of the program to conserve marsh birds and frogs. So what I'd like to do in the time remaining is highlight two areas of future research that we're working on right now, both of which take place entirely or in part in the Long Point World Biosphere. So last year, we published this paper based in part on Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program data and presented it here at this conference. We concluded that control of invasive Phragmites works well for increasing breeding marsh birds, especially bird species of conservation concern. But as for marsh breeding frogs, we found no obvious influence of control of Phragmites that was detectable based on occurrence information, meaning whether the species was present or not at a sample location before and after control. However, we noted that abundance data for frogs might tell a different story. And what I mean by that is we might have gotten a different result if we had information on counts of individual frogs before and after control and not just occurrence based on their presence or absence. So Birds Canada has started a project through its Long Point Waterfowl and Wetlands Research Program with support from Environment and Climate Change Canada and the Nature Conservancy of Canada in collaboration with scientists from McGill University, including David Green, who many of you will know due to his many decades of studying Fowler's toads on Long Point. And despite the challenges of COVID, we were able to get the field work done this year, a little later in the season than we had hoped, but still useful. The basic approach is to trap frog tadpoles and to a certain extent adults as well, using minnow traps as a measure of frog abundance before and after control of Phragmites. Minnow traps um, have been successfully used before in the paper you see at the bottom right to measure frog abundance within Phragmites stands compared to outside in southern Quebec. So we figured the method is sound for use here. So the team is just starting to look at the data. We're catching a bunch of other critters along with the expected tadpoles and a few adult frogs. And as you can see in the top right graph, the other, other critters range from fish to snails. We're also um, continuing David's long-term Fowler's toad population monitoring work to look at patterns in relation to concurrent control of Phragmites over the next year or two. As you can see in the map, the bottom right, there were quite a few Fowler's toads captured this year all up and down the beach adjacent to Long Point Provincial Park. The population seems to be benefiting from sand blowouts into the marsh as a result of storms in the high lake levels, which provide preferred egg laying substrates. And of course, the future removal of Phragmites will likely benefit this population of endangered toads even more, which is quite exciting. We look forward to reporting more from this project at this conference and elsewhere in the future. Okay, so the second project that we're just starting will be part of Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas 3, which runs for the next five years, starting in 2021. If you're not familiar, the Breeding Bird Atlas is a citizen science project that documents the distribution of breeding bird species in these 10 by 10 kilometer squares uh, set systematically throughout the entire province, like you see here for Black Turn, showing data from the, the last Breeding Bird Atlas. The first and second atlases occurred in the early 1980s and the early 2000s, which allows for extremely powerful analysis of changes over time across the entire province, as well as a large suite of other important analyses useful for conservation.
So part of uh, the Breeding Bird Atlas survey protocol involves performing a number of point counts at random roadside locations within each 10 by 10 kilometer square, shown here at the left for the Atlas square that includes Big Creek National Wildlife Area at the base of Long Point. And these point counts are stationary counts of all species lasting five minutes. And in the second Atlas in the early 2000s, an amazing 66,000 point counts like this were completed throughout the province. This huge data set obviously allows for generation of science products like the abundance map pictured here on the right for common yellowthroat. And notably, Atlas point counts, uh, thanks for the five minutes, notably Atlas point counts have never focused on elusive marsh birds before, such as rails and gallinules. And as a result, Atlas point counts have never targeted marsh bird habitat, nor have they used call broadcasts to get the high detection rates required to generate these types of products for these really secretive birds. So for this second project, we're developing a, spe a special marsh bird point count protocol for Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas III. And this will generate Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program style data for elusive marsh bird breeding species throughout the entire province, including central Ontario, much of the boreal, in parts of the far north where we have almost no coverage by the marsh monitoring program. So for the first time ever, and this is really exciting, um, we'll be able to map abundance of species like this common gallinule shown on the right throughout all of Ontario. And for the first time, we'll be able to accurately estimate total population sizes for the, these elusive species across the whole province. And this will be very useful on many different levels for conservation management and planning. Okay, so we covered quite a bit here. Uh, to reiterate the main points, 2020 has been a landmark year, including the impressive 25th year of the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program of Birds Canada. The program has accomplished a great deal in terms of conserving marsh birds and frogs by reporting unique information on population trends and patterns, and by plugging the program's data into places where it leads to positive impact on the ground. And by engaging, educating, and motivating members of the public to take action to conserve wetlands and wetland wildlife. We look forward to expanding on these accomplishments over the next 25 years. And I'd like to end with a big thank you to the many organizations that support the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program shown here. And I'd also uh, like to thank you all very much for listening. Okay. Well, oh, thanks, Doug. What an achievement, 25 years of monitoring. Wow, that's amazing. It really gives us a look at the big picture. And uh, I love when you talk about motivating the public. That's where I very, feel very passionate about. And I love that you put those quotes in there because it shows you what people are thinking. So there is um, a question, a couple questions, a question here. Two questions, and um, I'm going to read over the first one, and then we'll see uh, if we can get to the second one. And like, of course, Doug, uh, you can answer these, and everyone will be able to see. Uh, for Doug, uh, Hannah McCurdy Adams, I've used lots of marsh monitoring program data as an expert to try to find chorus frogs, and more often found spring peepers, which are more likely to use the large marsh habitats. How do you reduce incorrect IDs of spring peeper calls as chorus frogs? They both call with a similar trill. Yes, this is, uh, this is a bit, uh, an issue. Um, a couple of ways that we try to avoid the two species being confused. Um, we, um, during our training sessions, our in-person training sessions and online, we um, play and discuss um, recordings of the similar trill calls um, to try and, and educate our observers so that they're aware um, that the two can sound really similar. Um, and we also um, often put literature in our um, participant newsletters that uh, warn people about the similarities of their calls. But in the end, it, they are very difficult and no matter what we do, we have to, um, you know, tolerate a certain amount of 
um, incorrect calls. We also tend to try our best to follow up on uh, out of range chorus frog records directly with the uh, individual, but in the end, it is sometimes uh, incorrect data sneak through. Okay, so that kind of gives us hope that uh, if the expert is telling us it's difficult, then uh, we got to just keep persevering <laughs> or studying. <laughs> okay, and it's getting out there, right? Okay, one more, and I'll read it off, and then we'll see um, how long uh, or how extensive the question answer is. And if not, then of course, Doug will address it um, after. Okay, question for Doug. This is from Derek. Um, sorry, I'm going to try and pronounce your name right. Uh, when you were using minnow traps for tadpole sampling, you noted a number of fish also being caught. One of those was pickerel. Do you mean the fish also commonly called walleye or a small cousin of the fish related to musky northern pike? I'm not aware of the presence of chain or redfin pickerel around Long Point, so this would be of interest to me. Yeah, um, I'm Derek. I'm going to have to uh, follow up with you on that and check with the grad student, our grad student who made the uh, the graph, and um, and and get back to you on that because I'm not sure what species exactly we're referring to in the graph. Okay, excellent. So. Uh, Doug will get that information to you. And if you do have questions uh, into the future, we can always um, contact us and we'll get that back to you. And is there another question here? Maybe, nope. Okay, so we'll, uh, thanks again, Doug. Uh, we'll see you next year, probably. <laughs> if we're on probably. trend. <clears throat> Excellent, thanks so, so much. Thank you. So we'll move on to our next presenter, Kristen Bernard. And Kristen, Kristen Bernard is the program director for the Nature Conservancy of Canada's Southwestern Ontario subregion. She oversees conservation activities within the Southern Norfolk Sand Plain, Essex Forest, and wetlands and Western Lake Erie Islands natural areas, as well as several other properties throughout the subregion, with a focus on land acquisition, stewardship, community outreach, and partnership development. Oh, thank you, Kristen, and uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, I will share my screen in a minute. There we go. This is my first Zoom presentation, so you'll have to let me know if everything is showing up as it should. <laughs> a lot of different platforms to get uh, familiar with. So far, so good. If you uh, just click uh, presenter, then it will make your slides full screen. Perfect. There we are. All right. So uh, as, as Tara said, I'm Kristen Bernard. I'm program director for NCC Southwestern. Ontario subregion. I um, live here in the Long Point Walsingham Forest Priority Place. NCC has an office just outside of Port Rowan. And um, we, we have been a part of the Priority Place Collaborative uh, since its initiation. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today a bit about uh, the Open Country Working Group. We are uh, a relatively new group uh, working together. So I'll be switching gears a little bit uh, with this presentation and providing a bit of a 101 on open country and why it was included in the integrated conservation action plan and then provide a snapshot of what the groups uh, will be working on individually in, in the years to come. So uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the term open country, um, it's, it's been defined in the integrated action plan or conservation action plan as uh, tall grass communities that uh, need to be maintained uh, in an open state by either fire, grazing or mowing. So tall grass communities, uh, they are habitats that are made up primarily of, of grasses and forbs. Um, there's some examples of a tall grass in the top right photo, that would be Indian grass uh, with some trees. 
and tall grass communities can sort of be further divided into oak woodland, uh, oak savanna, and then your open tall grass type habitat. Uh, open country also includes shrub thicket and meadows um, and systems that you may generally view as sort of early successional that can be maintained in an open open habitat uh, through various means, um, but are providing a niche between that sort of open state and forest state. So in the open country work plan, it is identified that only about 3% of tall grass communities or open country habitat remains in Ontario. Um, historically, most of the tall grass communities and open country habitat was found in Southern Ontario. And uh, these habitat types were quite easy to convert to agriculture. So they were some of the first to go when the land was being, being cleared. Um, and here in the Long Point Walsingham Forest Priority Place, uh, these habitats make up less than 1% of uh, the landscape, but they provide habitat for so many uh, rare, unique, and endangered species. You know, the charismatic American badger, uh, there's grasshopper sparrow, hognose snakes, etc. So they are, they're very important uh, homes for wildlife and they also provide really important ecosystem services. I feel like I might be speaking or speaking to the choir here. Um, we probably all know how important these, these habitat types are and evidently um, open country habitat ranked pretty high as a priority habitat to include in the integrated conservation action plan. So some other, I guess, neat facts, 20% of Ontario's rare plants are found in tall grass systems and uh, they are great habitat types for carbon sequestration, erosion control and other uh, ecosystem services. The direct threat identified in the open country work plan was fire suppression, uh, particularly relevant to the tall grass community side of open country habitats. Uh, we no longer really use uh, fire as a tool on the landscape to maintain uh, habitats. And, uh, you know, we generally have a view to suppressing fire uh, when it is happening for good reason. And this is, uh, a, you know, a primary reason for why the habitats that do exist today close in relatively quickly because uh, this tool is hard to use on the landscape. Uh, certainly lucky here in Norfolk County that uh, a long history of using fire for uh, stewardship and habitat management does make it easier for partners today to continue with these activities. Um, but uh, prescribed fire can be, can be quite expensive and in some communities can be uh, seen as a threat to other more human valued things and harder to get off the ground. So the open country component of the ICAP was uh, developed by Jessica Linton, who is a biologist with Natural Resource Solutions Incorporated. She presented at the Biosphere Research Forum last year on her work on the model dusky wing butterfly recovery. And there was uh, input from a lot of other working group partners as well. The current collaborative of the open country working group includes NCC, Ontario Nature, Long Point Basin Land Trust, St. Williams Conservation Reserve Community Council, Natural Resource Solutions, Norfolk Alternative Land Use, Ontario Plant Restoration Alliance, and Ontario Parks. Of uh, that large number of partners on the working group, there are four to five, five key partners working on implementing strategies and activities in the ICAP, and that's NCC and Natural Resource Solutions. St. Williams Conservation Reserve, Long Point Basin Land Trust, and Ontario Nature. Of that group, three of those organizations are very involved in the management of habitat on the ground, being St. Williams, Long Point Basin Land Trust, and NCC. And our work plan for the next three years have a, has a pretty heavy focus on the restoration of tall grass and open country habitats uh, through seeding, direct seeding in agricultural uh, fields. Some of you may be familiar with NCC's work uh, in and around the Long Point uh, Walsingham Forest Priority Place and the Long Point Basin Land Trust is also active in land restoration. 
as well as habitat enhancement. Enhancement refers to uh, active stewardship activities to um, improve the overall condition of existing open country habitat. We are aiming to do about 100 hectares of enhancement activities uh, by the end of this year, which will involve a lot of conifer management, the management of invasive shrubs like autumn olive and multiflora rose. Uh, we see these uh, commonly on our roadsides and they uh, were planted back in the 80s and 90s as a reforestation initiative and also to create wildlife fence rows by the MNRF. Uh, the legacy of which is that our roadsides are relatively inundated with these non-native flowering shrubs and they readily colonize in open fields. So there's going to be a big push to try and deal with some of the seed sources of these plants and because they are colonizing quite readily in restored fields and existing habitat. And uh, if we can start to identify and prioritize some of the key seed source areas, uh, the control of which should have some spillover effects and reduce the populations overall. Ontario Nature and NRSI are very involved in the species at risk survey and monitoring side of our open country working group. And their work is largely going to be focused on species at risk snake surveying in and around Bacchus Woods in the Turkey Point area and on other properties. We'll also be conducting some public education and outreach activities through our partnership with Norfolk Alice and some of the work that Jessica Linton is going to be doing through her model dusky wing butterfly recovery project, which I can speak to a little bit closer to the end of the presentation. And with the work of the Norfolk Alternative Land Use Services, there will be a component of private landowner stewardship and the Long Point Basin Land Trust will also be doing some activities to enhance habitat on private lands. Some of the initial activities that have been undertaken in the Open Country Working Group was the development of a tall grass prairie database for the priority place and surrounding areas. Uh, back in the late 90s, Tall Grass Ontario, which is a not-for-profit organization focused on education and outreach and collaboration to improve uh, knowledge and understanding of tall grass habitats across southern Ontario, developed the first tall grass prairie database, but it had largely been sitting dormant ever since. So Jessica Linton and Pat Deacon from NRSI uh, did a variety of different surveys uh, to get a better handle on the types of tall grass communities on the landscape. Their initial data suggests there's about 1,333 hectares of tall grass habitat in the priority place. 842 hectares of which were identified as replanted, which would be largely on former agricultural fields. 67 hectares was uh, remnant savanna, and 424 were identified as tall grass woodland. The idea is to use this habitat uh, database to continue to track uh, tall grass habitat restoration and enhancement activities and identify new areas of tall grass previously uh, unmapped and undocumented in the priority place and elsewhere. Through the Canada Nature Fund that helps to initiate open country uh, work, including the tall grass database, we also received some habitat restoration funds to conduct a prescribed burn on one of the Nature Conservancy of Canada's restored fields in the Bacchus block. So uh, this map here shows you the areas that were burned. And uh, this is the East Quarter Line Road. For those of you that are local and just north of this would be Highway 24, uh, which is uh, commonly referred to as Sparrow's Corners because of the great sparrow bird watching opportunities one can enjoy in the restored fields that are most, uh, that are on the three corners of that uh, highway intersection. So this prescribed burn was the first burn that NCC has conducted here in Norfolk. And we've done um, significant landscape scale restoration of agricultural fields. We are now starting to undertake more direct action related to our restored oak savanna target habitat types. 
And on these fields in particular, adjacent pine plantations have acted as uh, excellent seed sources for our fields. And we were dealing with some significant growth of non-native conifers. So the objective of the burn was really to knock those back um, and allow for the native vegetation to receive more sunlight and thrive. These properties have been identified as potential sites for a reintroduction program that Jessica Linton from Natural Resource Solution is working on in partnership with the University of Guelph, the Cambridge Butterfly Recovery, or the Cambridge Butterfly um, Center, as well as NCC. And uh, they've been doing a lot of work to trial captive rearing, um, as well as habitat mapping and management in areas across Southern Ontario, where the model dusky wing butterfly is still hanging on in small numbers. The idea would be to restore habitat through management activities like prescribed burns in order to go in and reseed with some of their favored plants, uh, for example, New Jersey tea and wild lupin. So after the site was burned, uh, here's a picture of it before, as you can see, quite green. This is from the same vantage point immediately after the burn. And this is a few months after the burn. Most of uh, the grasses you can see, as well as the oaks, have uh, rebounded quite well. And this photo here is of the wild lupins flowering in late spring. Some of the other initial activities that have occurred through Natural Resource Solutions have been pre and post habitat improvement monitoring, including vegetation surveys, insects and breeding birds, the results of which have been summarized in a report that I believe is available. So I have included contact information for all the partners at the end of this presentation. If you have specific questions about any of the work that I'll be going over, um, please do jot down their email address and get, uh, get in touch with them directly. So uh, looking forward, NCC will be con continuing to conduct burns in the same general area. Again, this is the East Quarter Line Road and Highway 24. Uh, this is the northern edge of the field that we burned uh, last year. We will also be conducting uh, conifer thinning in these red areas as well to reduce the seed sources and also open up these little pockets of oak woodland and oak savanna. The St. Williams Conservation Reserve Community Council will be conducting similar work. They are planning to uh, do prescribed burns and invasive species management. They are also implementing a seed strategy project, project whereby they will be using locally sourced seed to reseed all of their prescribed burn sites and other areas that have uh, received invasive species treatment. Audrey Hagee from the Community Conservation Reserve has been hosting a lot of volunteer seed bees. And if you have the time or interest, I would really encourage you to participate. It's a great way to learn more about the native plants in these systems and get out onto properties uh, and just enjoy nature. Uh, so again, they'll be conducting, uh, implementing prescribed burns as well. The Long Point Basin Land Trust, another partner in habitat restoration, will be developing plans to direct their tall grass and oak savanna habitat restoration projects. And they're going to be doing some seeding on some of their nature reserves in the priority place. They'll really be focused in the first year on the development of management plans and looking at the actions that they're going to need to undertake on some of their nature reserves in order to achieve better results through their enhancement activities. Natural Resource Solutions is going to continue with the development of their habitat database, their pre and post restoration surveys and NCC's Bacchus block, their insect surveys, and they will also be doing some species at risk snake radio telemetry monitoring this season. And lastly, Ontario Nature, who is another research partner on the working group, will be continuing with their long-term monitoring protocol using cover boards to assess population trends in Ontario snakes over time. So uh, this work is happening here in Long Point Walsingham Forest Priority Place, as well as other places in Southern Ontario. 
and they're going to be using the data to help assess uh, the effects of prescribed burns on species at risk snakes in open country habitat. Although I will note that when we do the prescribed burns, we do them outside the timing windows for active snakes and make sure that we uh, do sufficient surveys and sweeps of the fields before we burn in case there are any brave snakes that are coming out in the cold. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm sort of giving you a, a really high level overview of uh, work from a number of different partners and uh, I'm mostly only available to speak specifically to NCC's projects. So I've provided email addresses for the other partners here on this slide and I encourage you to write down their names and contact information should you have any questions. Oh, thank you, Kristen. Um, very interesting to hear about the continuation of natural resource solutions, continuing their research. Good to hear since we heard from them last year. I like those references from past conferences, bringing it forward. And I love the pictures because pictures speak a, a thousand words, right? Uh, the pictures of the prescribed burns gives people a perspective on, um, on how that is part of it all. Okay, thank you so much, Kristen, and uh, thanks so much for being with us. And I don't think there was any questions for you since you explained it so well. And I also thought I think NCC is a, a household name now. <laughs> uh, so we'll move on to the next presenter. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. So the next presenters, I should say, is Brittany Vezina and James Patterson. Brittany is the Conservation Projects Coordinator at Ontario Nature. She coordinates Ontario Nature's citizen science programs and has been involved with the Ontario Reptile and Amphibian Atlas since 2018. Dr. James Patterson is a past coordinator for the Ontario Reptile and Amphibian Atlas and a current uh, Liber Eero Fellow at Trent University. His research analyzes how habitat loss and road mortality affect local extinction risks of reptiles and amphibians in Southern Ontario. So welcome and thank you both to Brittany and James. Thanks, Tara. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for having us today. I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay. So yeah, uh, as Tara said, um, my name is Brittany and I'm the Conservation Projects Coordinator at Ontario Nature and I'll be joined shortly by my colleague James Patterson, who's from Trent University. And before I begin our presentation, I would just like to acknowledge that I'm presenting from Toronto, Ontario on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples and the current territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit under Treaty Number 13. Uh, my colleague James will be presenting from Winnipegosis, Manitoba on Treaty to territory and the traditional territory of Anishinaabe, Cray, OJ Cray, Assiniboine, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Metis Nation. So just to give you some background information on Con Ontario Nature, um, we're a conservation nonprofit that was formed in 1931, and we protect wild species and wild spaces through a variety of programs, which combine conservation, education, and engagement. And one such program is the Ontario Reptile and Amphibian Atlas, which has engaged the general public in collecting reptile and amphibian observations uh, since 2009. Now, the Ontario Reptile and Amphibian Atlas, or the ORAA, was not the first atlas effort in reptiles and amphibians in Ontario. The original herb atlas was the Ontario Herpetofaunal Summary, which ran from 1984 to 2008. And over this time, over 140,000 observations were collected, which led to the first comprehensive understanding of reptiles and amphibians, uh, amphibian distributions in the province. And then an effort to continue engagement in data collection, uh, the Eastern Ontario Herpetofaunal 
atlas uh, was launched in 2008 and then Ontario Nature expanded this atlas to the provincial scale under the ORAA in 2009. And now why a new atlas? While significant knowledge was gained through earlier atlas efforts, um, in 2009, knowledge gaps still existed with many regions either lacking recent observations or lacking observations completely, such as in certain areas in Northern Ontario. And now understanding where reptiles and amphibians exist is crucial to uh, their conservation for many reasons, including allowing the identification of important habitat uh, threats and potential hotspots of threats, and also with assisting uh, with assessing species at risk and developing recovery strategies. Therefore, the ORAA was created in an effort to improve our knowledge of the distributions of reptiles and amphibians in Ontario. And additionally, as was similar to earlier ATLAS efforts in the province, outreach and engagement remained a core focus of the program, uh, with the ORAA soliciting observations from community members, researchers, and organizations province-wide. And our program ran from 2009 uh, to 2019, um, with efforts shifting from data collection to data analysis uh, in 2019, uh, with the production of a publication aiming for release in 2021. And now the overarching goal of our upcoming publication is to highlight trends that have been found over 30 plus years of data collection and to use this as a tool to continue engaging the public and teaching about herb diversity threats and conservation issues. And we also want to use this immense data set to inform conservation efforts moving forward. So just to give you a brief overview of how data was collected under the ORAA, uh, similar to the breeding bird atlas, which we heard a bit about earlier, um, the province of Ontario was divided into 10 by 10 kilometer squares. And observations were collected from a wide range of individuals, from citizen scientists and naturalists, grad students and trained herpetologists, and a variety of organizations from research institutions, nonprofits, uh, consultancies, land trusts, and conservation authorities, to name a few, with each observation then being associated with a specific grid square in the province. And effort varied across the province and across records, as some records uh, were developed from intentional standardized surveys, while many others were also just opportunistic observations. And we accepted uh, records through a variety of means from mail, email, or phone in the earlier days. And then later in the program, we also introduced our ORAA app. And we accepted single observations to spreadsheets of multiple observations. And of course, we verified all observations for accuracy in terms of ID and also location um, and staff and volunteer experts helped with this process. And so what have we found? Over the lifetime of the ATLAS, and this is all three um, ATLAS efforts, we have a cumulative database of over 480,000 observations and over 250,000 of which were collected through the 10 years of the ORAA. And now the success of the Atlas has largely been from the immense efforts of our many data contributors and volunteers and collaborations with multiple organizations across the province. And this includes over 12,000 people and over 200 organizations. So it was a mass collaboration. Um, and the growth of the Atlas itself uh, over the past 10 years would not have been possible without the efforts in engaging the public um, with the ORAA, engaging over 27,000 individuals in more than 260 events across the province. And so just to give you a bit of examples of how our knowledge has improved over the years, um, here I have uh, the range map of the Blanding's turtle, which is a species at risk, um, and what our, current, our knowledge was in 1998. So there's roughly 1,700 observations in the atlas. The red squares represent uh, historical observations where the species wasn't observed for the past 20 years, uh, whereas yellow is recent observations that were only observed within the past 20 years, and then green are both before and after that 20-year point. 
and then to 2018, uh, where we gained 8,000 observations of Blanding's turtle, and uh, we gained over 300 squares of recent observations where Blanding's turtle was not observed uh, 20 years prior. And we have certainly also improved our knowledge for many common species as well, including the Eastern red-backed salamander. Here in 1998, you can see we've got about 3,600 observations across the province. And then in 2018, uh, the number of record, records uh, more than doubled, and we also gained over 300 squares with new observations that were not uh, observed 20 years prior. And so when it comes to the Long Point region, um, as many people have spoken about today, it is, a, it is an area um, of high biodiversity. And this, uh, this is also true for reptiles and amphibians uh, with 21 reptiles and 16 amphibian species across Norfolk County. Um, and if you look at the map here, this, uh, this shows the, the number of observations in the Atlas by grid square. Uh, you can see the immense efforts of individuals and organizations from the area. Uh, with over 18,000 observations um, over the life of the atlas. And as we also know, based on a lot of uh, talks today, um, there's also many threats facing reptiles and amphibians in this region. Uh, this figure here uh, shows us the percentage of alive, dead, and in injured individuals found on roads across Norfolk County, uh, with snakes and turtles making up the bulk of road observations. And so the important question is, what can we do with this immense data set and our updated knowledge, and how can we use it to inform uh, future conservation efforts? Uh, so I'm now going to pass things off to my colleague, James, who's going to explain how he has been analyzing Atlas data in more depth um, in an effort to address these questions. Thanks, Brittany. Two of the largest threats to reptiles and amphibians in Ontario. But the loss of habitat from expanding areas for agriculture and urbanization and road mortality as animals are struck by vehicles crossing roads. When we look at southern Ontario, it's a landscape that's strongly shaped by agriculture and urbanization. Even in a region such as Norfolk County that has a high number of protected areas, we can see that most of the habitat has been converted to agriculture. And with this intense land use, comes a very dense road network. With this many roads, it means that most reptiles and amphibians are going to be affected by the road network, either by having to cross road structures or by being isolated or fragmented from roads. We were interested in what affects whether a species is present at a site. And we predicted that that was going to be shaped by climate, habitat type, and then by anthropogenic threats, including the amount of habitat loss and the density of the road network. Our objectives were to test how habitat loss and road density affect reptile occupancy, and second, to identify new locations of reptile populations. We did this using observations from the Ontario Reptile Amphibian Atlas, and we did so using a, an occupancy modeling framework. Occupancy models can incorporate differences between sites and landscape variables, but also differences in search effort. And the models estimate two different parameters. The first is detection probability. That's the chance of finding a species if it's present. And the second is occupancy probability. That's the likelihood of a species being present at a site. We use the results of these models to be able to predict relationships, for example, with habitat loss, but also to predict sites that have a high chance of a species occurring there, but for which we have no confirmed sighting. Now, generally, we can see that reptiles were less likely to occur in sites with more habitat loss. Now, on the y-axis of these graphs is occupancy probability, with a value near zero, meaning a very low chance of the species occurring there and a value at the top near one means a very high chance of a species occurring there. 
on the x-axis as we move from left to right, we are increasing the amount of habitat loss at a site due to agriculture and urbanization. You can see that both for Blanding's turtles on the left and for northern math turtles on the right, that the chance of a species occurring at a site decreases as habitat loss increases. Although the relationship between these species is different. We saw similar patterns in snake species, although again, there is wide variation in the response between species. Here on the left are our eastern hognose snakes, and on the right are eastern fox snakes. Now, one of the things we wanted to do to take this a step further was to look at the predicted occupancy using maps. This is the confirmed and predicted occupancy for Blanding turtles in the Norfolk region. And so the green squares show sites that have confirmed sightings of Blanding turtle in the last 10 years. And the other colored squares are on a gradient from blue with a low predicted occupancy to yellow with a very high predicted occupancy. And so this information is very useful if you're trying to identify places to look for new population of Blanding turtles. So you would first invest time and money in surveying the sites that are most yellow because they have the highest probability of the species occurring there. On this map, you can see the predicted occupancy for eastern fox snake. And I wanted to present this map as an example of how we can combine information from multiple species in order to maximize the chances of finding new populations of several target species. So if we look at the yellow square in the bottom right, and then look at the predicted occupancy for eastern hognose snake, you can see that the same square has a very high predicted occupancy. And so by combining maps across several species, we can identify sites that have the highest probability of locating several target species at risk. For some species, we have much less knowledge about their distribution. And so these predicted occupancy maps are even more useful for identifying sites that are likely to have populations. As one example, I've shown the predicted occupancy for eastern ribbon snake to have much fewer squares with confirmed occupancy, but several squares with very high predicted probability of occurrence. Our work highlights that habitat loss is a major threat to reptiles and was one of the best predictors of whether a species occurred at a site. It also highlights the need to know where species persist in order to accurately evaluate how endangered populations are and in order to prioritize conservation action. The next steps for our work are to direct search effort to sites with a high probability of occupancy, such as shown in the maps, and second, to prioritize locations for conservation action. I'm now going to flip it back to Brittany, who's going to finish off our presentation. Thanks for that, James. Um, we hope that this presentation, as well as other presentations um, from today, have demonstrated the value and power of community engagement in conservation and how community science and large scale collaborations and data collection can be used to direct future actions. While we have greatly improved our knowledge of reptiles and amphibians in Ontario since 1984, continued community engagement and stewardship will be essential to herb conservation in the long term. And this includes many of the important initiatives that have been presented on today and certainly continued survey efforts, particularly so in areas where our knowledge is still lacking. As James's research has pointed out, there's certainly still much that we can learn, even in an area such as Long Point region where there has already been considerable efforts. Now, while Ontario Nature is no longer accepting observations directly, we do strongly encourage uh, further submissions to our Herbs of Ontario project, um, NI Naturalists, or NHIC's Rare Species of Ontario project for species at risk. And of course, we cannot finish this presentation without acknowledging efforts behind this project's success. Uh, we, we owe many thanks to all funders, partners, the many volunteers and data contributors to the Atlas project, uh, without which the success really would not have been possible. And this does include a number of individuals, many, many individuals and organizations in the Long Point region in Norfolk County who have contributed as well. Um, the list is very long, but uh, just to 
mention a few Birds Canada Marsh Monitoring Program, um, Long Point Basin Land Trust, Long Point Bird Observatory, um, Nature Conservancy of Canada, the Ontario Road Ecology Group, and many more. Uh, but you will be able to find a full list of acknowledgements once the final publication is released in 2021, um, as well as much more information on things that we've only briefly touched on in this presentation. Um, so yeah, that the aim is for 2021. So uh, watch Ontario Nature's social media channels. We will definitely be promoting as we get closer to the release. Um, and I can throw my uh, my contact information in the, the chat for anyone who wants to follow up for more information. And thanks everyone for listening. If you have any questions, I will turn it over to Tara. Oh, love that picture. Isn't that great? Uh, I love the words that keep coming up today. Collaboration, community engagement, really important. Um, I love that uh, predicted occupancy map, which those maps that will be a great benefit into the future. Um, and once again, shows us the importance of uh, healthy habitat. That's the most important thing is healthy habitats. And so thank you, Brittany. And thank you, James, from coming across or beaming out from the prairies. <laughs> I don't know if your days has been as lovely as ours outside. Uh, we can look out the window here. Um, so thank you, Brittany and James, so much for ending this uh, conference today. And I just want to um, close by thanking everyone for participating today, not only the presenters, but everyone, like I said, we're all outdoor loving folks. So, you know, I really appreciate um, missing the nice weather out today to sit with us. I really appreciate that. And I would like to thank our sponsor, Environment and Climate Change Canada. And to let you know once again that the, this webinar was recorded and will be up on the Biosphere's website for future viewing, which is a bonus of doing it this way. And uh, once again, I really deeply wanna thank Amanda um, for helping today. Uh, this wouldn't have actually been possible without her. <laughs> and so I would like to I uh, wish everyone a great weekend and um, besides James, maybe <laughs> it's going to be a beautiful weather out there. So hopefully we can enjoy the nature that we've been talking about today. And we really hope to see you next year at the Long Point Biosphere Reserve uh, Research and Conservation Conference. Uh, whether it's in person or like this again, it's all very, very important. So we're uh, very lucky to have this platform and Amanda's expertise to make this happen. So um, uh, there may be a question here. Oh, and uh, James is just saying, if there is a question about the Atlas occupancy maps, which I thought was super cool. Um, he says, feel free to reach out and there's his email. And I'm pretty sure, or I'm sure that all the presenters and us as well will be happy to um, further answer any questions. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone and we hope to see you next year.